I've been a park ranger at the Redwood National and State Parks for over 10 years now. I've seen my fair share of oddities, strange tracks, unexplainable noises, even a few glimpses of creatures that didn't quite fit the usual fauna. But nothing, absolutely nothing, prepared me for what I've been experiencing lately. It all began a few weeks ago. I was out on my usual patrol, the moon casting long, eerie shadows between the towering redwoods. I'd always loved the forest at night, the way it seemed to come alive with a different kind of energy. But that night, something felt off. The usual chorus of nocturnal creatures was strangely muted, replaced by an unsettling silence. As I made my way along the trail, I noticed something unusual. A series of large footprints, unlike any I'd seen before. They were vaguely humanoid, but far too large to be human. And the claws. They were unlike any creature I knew of in these woods. I felt a shiver of unease, but I pushed it aside, attributing it to the strange atmosphere. A few nights later, I saw it. I was on a late patrol, the forest bathed in an ethereal glow from the full moon. I was nearing the edge of a clearing when I saw a figure in the distance. It was tall, easily seven feet, and covered in a thick, matted fur that seemed to absorb the moonlight. Its muscular form was hunched, as if it was not used to standing upright. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I took in the sight. Its eyes, glowing an unnatural yellow, met mine, and I felt a chill run down my spine. It was a primal fear, a fear of a predator. And then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone, leaving only the echo of a low growl and the rustle of undergrowth. I reported what I'd seen to the other rangers, but they dismissed it, attributing it to the shadows and my overactive imagination. But I knew what I'd seen, and I knew it was real. I could still feel its gaze on me, a predator sizing up its prey. A few nights later, my suspicions were confirmed. I was returning from a late patrol when I noticed a light on in one of the cabins. As I approached, I saw them, my fellow rangers carrying a gurney into the cabin. I had no idea why they would do that, and especially why they would at night. I asked them about it on my next shift, and they all dismissed it and blew me off. It was really weird. I've been watching the other rangers closely, trying to pick up on any signs of deceit. They're good people, I've worked with them for years, but there's a tension in the air now. A secret being kept. I can't shake the feeling that they know more about the creature than they're letting on. I've been patrolling more frequently, especially at night. I'm drawn to the forest, to the mystery it's hiding. One night I decided to stake out the cabin where I'd seen the gurney. I hid in the underbrush, the cool night air sending shivers down my spine. Hours passed, the forest alive with the sounds of the night. Just as I was about to give up and head back, I saw a light flicker on in the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the door slowly open. Two of my fellow rangers emerged, their faces obscured by the darkness. Between them, they were carrying another gurney. My breath hitched as I saw the figure on it, large, covered in a sheet, unmistakably the creature. I watched as they loaded the gurney into a van and drove off, leaving me alone in the darkness. I felt a mix of fear and determination. I knew I had to follow them, to uncover the truth. I trailed the van at a safe distance, my mind racing. Where were they taking the creature? Why were they hiding it? The drive seemed to last forever, but finally we arrived at a secluded facility on the outskirts of the park. I watched as they unloaded the gurney and disappeared inside. I waited until the coast was clear, then made my way to the facility. I had to know what was going on. I found a window and peered inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. The creature was there, alive but restrained. Scientists in lab coats were gathered around it, taking notes and discussing in hushed tones. I knew then that I had to do something. I couldn't let this continue. I retreated back into the forest, my mind whirling with plans and possibilities. I had to expose the truth, for the sake of the creature and the integrity of the park. I've started gathering evidence, documenting everything I can. I've set up a hidden camera, and I'm keeping a close eye on the other rangers and the facility. I'm not sure what I'll find, or what I'll do when I find it, but I know I can't stand by and do nothing. I'll keep you updated on what I find.
But for now, remember not everything in the forest is as it seems. And sometimes the real monsters are not the creatures in the shadows, but the ones hiding in plain sight. I've been tuning into your channel for a bit now. I've always been intrigued by your stories, how they all seem to be these random encounters with the supernatural. But let me tell you about my own experience. You could call me a researcher, I suppose, but I'm no academic. I'm just a regular guy who's always had a fascination with the unexplained. I've spent the better part of my life chasing after these mysteries, and it took me 20 years until I had the encounter I'm about to share with you. I was on a trip with my son, visiting Louisiana. We were exploring the swamps, far away from the hustle and bustle of New Orleans. We'd heard rumors of a strange creature lurking in these parts, something the locals referred to as the Rougarou. Now, I'm not one to believe in tall tales, but there was something about these stories that piqued my interest. We'd been out in the swamps for a few days following up on these rumors. We hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary, just the usual swamp wildlife. But then, one evening, things took a turn. We were sitting by our campfire, just about to turn in for the night, when we heard a rustling in the undergrowth. Now, I've been camping enough times to know the sounds of the night, but this, this was different. It was heavier, slower, like something big was moving around out there. I grabbed my flashlight and shone it towards the noise. For a moment, all we saw were the shadows of the trees. But then, something moved. Something big. It was just a silhouette, but it was enough to make my heart skip a beat. I could see it was tall, standing on two legs with broad shoulders. It looked more like a man than any animal I'd ever seen. My son was scared, I could tell. But I told him to stay quiet, to stay still. We watched as the creature moved slowly around our camp, always staying just out of the light. It circled us a few times, then disappeared back into the swamp. We didn't sleep much that night, as you can imagine. The next day we were on high alert. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig had us jumping. But the swamp was quiet, eerily so. It was as if the whole world was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. Then the next evening, out of the silence, we heard it. A low growl, guttural and primal. It sent a chill down my spine. I grabbed my flashlight again, my hand shaking just a bit. I shone the light towards the sound, my heart pounding in my chest, and there it was again. The creature. It was closer now, close enough for us to make out details. It was covered in thick, matted fur, dark as the night around us. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, glowing an eerie yellow. It had a snout like a dog or a wolf, but its body was more human-like. Muscular arms ended in clawed hands, and its posture was hunched, as if it was ready to pounce. I knew it was the Rougarou, the creature from the stories. Seeing it up close, in the flesh, was both terrifying and fascinating. It was a creature of legend, a myth come to life, and it was standing right in front of us. The Rougarou didn't make any aggressive moves. It just watched us, its eyes never leaving ours. It was almost as if it was curious, studying us just as we were studying it. We were in its territory, guests in its home, and it was deciding what to do with us. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone. It turned and disappeared into the swamp, leaving us alone in the silence once more. We were left with the crackling of our fire and the pounding of our hearts. We didn't speak of it for the rest of the trip. It was as if we were both trying to process what we had seen, to make sense of it. But there was no making sense of it. We had come face to face with a legend, with a creature that shouldn't exist. But it did. We had seen it with our own eyes. That encounter changed us, changed how we saw the world. It was a reminder that there are still mysteries out there, still things that defy explanation. And as terrifying as it was, I wouldn't change a thing. It was an experience, a story that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. I had an encounter in Oregon. My name is Samuel, and about five years ago, I was a bachelor living just outside of Bend, Oregon. 
Anyone familiar with that area probably knows about the Deschutes National Forest nearby, as well as several additional state parks. I had moved to Bend from New York to follow my dream of becoming a wildlife photographer, but it ended up being more challenging than I thought. I was living in a small cabin in a remote area, and my nearest neighbor was actually a lumber mill, so I didn't have anyone to interact with regularly. Sometimes I would call my brother back home to chat, he was married with a few kids of his own, or I'd spend a while talking to the delivery guy, usually an older man named Hank who would come down my long driveway to deliver packages. With a little less than a month to go until I could move back home, autumn started creeping up. The leaves were changing colors and falling, and after a few days I was able to calm down and enjoy the peace. So, one evening I was packing up the majority of my studio except for necessities. The cabin was surrounded by fir trees, so we were covered in shade relatively early in the evening, and it also got dark faster in our area. I had just started putting away a set of expensive camera equipment when I heard what sounded like a branch hitting a window. I stopped to listen, but I found it hard to concentrate as my dog, Max, started barking. I walked over to quiet him down and heard the sound again, a little thudding sound like a branch hitting glass and bouncing off. It was coming from the direction of the living room. Immediately I stiffened up. After all, I was living alone in this cabin with a dog in an area I didn't really like. The nearest person would hopefully respond if I needed. The lights were off in the living room, so I just stuck my head into the room and looked at the windows quickly. As I glanced around, a branch bounced off the far window and I jerked back into the studio. Probably just a deer playing around, I tried to convince myself, but knew there weren't any deer in the area. Max, my dog, didn't seem bothered by what was happening and I went back to him, petting him as if he was the one who needed comforting. For a few minutes it was quiet and I was just starting to catch my breath when I heard the garage door rattle. It was one of those big wooden doors that you have to pull down over the carport. I ran to the studio window and looked out into the driveway where the light clearly outlined something walking around. At first, I thought I was looking at someone in a Halloween costume. It looked like a Bigfoot getup, but I realized quickly that it was too realistic, not loose like I would expect a costume to be. What I was looking at was a large ape-like creature standing on its hind legs. I could only watch as it moved around the side of the garage and made another banging sound. It must have been hitting the side of the garage for some reason. As soon as I couldn't see it anymore, I went and grabbed Max and headed upstairs, where I could look down on the front yard out of the bedroom window. We stayed up there for maybe 10 minutes before I heard a vehicle come down the driveway. It was the delivery truck with headlights on, and I held Max tightly as I ran back downstairs to meet Hank. I didn't open the screen door right away and he looked confused waiting on the porch. Hey, I said to him breathlessly and then explained what had happened. He listened without interrupting, only turning once to look at the garage door, which was closed. When I finished, he stepped off the porch and went to the garage. I warned him to be careful. He took his phone out, took a few photos and came back to the house to show me through the screen door. The photos were of footprints. I can only describe them as really big footprints. If I spread my hand out, they were larger than that, and five-toed. Hank could tell how freaked out I was and started to explain to me about the supposed Bigfoot sightings in the area. I hadn't heard of them before. This wasn't any kind of legend I'd heard back home. He told me that there were a few reports every year, and they were really similar to mine. Bigfoot coming to remote houses and messing with things, never hurting anyone but always doing something to scare people. The banging on the garage and throwing branches was pretty standard. He told me that if I hadn't gone upstairs, I probably would have seen it looking through the first floor windows at me. All I can say is, I'm happy I didn't. I probably would have had a heart attack. A few weeks later, as planned, I moved back east to a much more populated area about 10 minutes away from my brother. Max is seven now, and every now and then I wonder if I should tell him this story when he's older. But I think he's like me, and it would probably mess with him more than help. Anyway, there is no reason for him to really know about it. My dream is still in Oregon and will probably stay there. I often wonder if it's encountered anything. 
doesn't really matter, though, because there is no way I'd be willing to go back down there. My encounter isn't something I'd want to experience again. I've got a tale for you that's going to make your hair stand on end. I am not the only one who's seen things that don't make a lick of sense. So I was up in the Appalachian Mountains. Just a regular guy, taking a break from the hustle and bustle of city life. I am not a believer in ghosts or goblins, but what I saw up there, well, it shook me to my core. I was sleeping in this little cabin I'd rented, nestled right in the heart of the mountains. It was quiet peaceful, and I felt safe. That was until I heard this weird noise outside my window. Sounded like scratching, like something was trying to get in. I got up to check it out, and that's when I saw it. This thing, this creature, was right outside my window. It was pale, with long arms and fingers that ended in claws. Its eyes were like two black holes, and it had this twisted grin on its face. It was like something out of a nightmare, a mix of man and beast, and it was staring right at me. I was shocked just staring back at this thing. And then all of a sudden, it lunged through the window, landing right in the middle of my cabin. I fell back and it gave me this weird look before jumping back out the window. I was too scared to move, too shocked to call for help. I was alone, in the middle of nowhere, with this creature. It was gone but the mess it left behind was proof enough that it had been there. My window was shattered, glass everywhere. And then I heard another window break. It was back, and it was inside my cabin. I could hear it moving around, and I knew it was coming for me. I managed to slam my bedroom door shut just as it reached for me. I could hear it clawing at the door, its breathing heavy and ragged. In a panic, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I could barely get the words out, but the dispatcher could hear the fear in my voice and sent help. The clawing eventually stopped, and I heard the creature leave. When the cops showed up, they found me huddled in a corner, shaking like a leaf. They searched the cabin, but there was no sign of the creature. They took my statement, but I could tell they didn't believe me. They suggested it might have been a burglar, but I knew the truth. After doing some research, I found out that the creature I saw was called the Rake. It's a paranormal entity that's been around for centuries, preying on people and leaving them traumatized. I found out that I wasn't the only one who'd seen it, and that gave me some comfort. Since that night, I've done everything I can to protect myself. I've put extra locks on my doors and windows, and I always keep a weapon close by. I still have nightmares about that night, and I know I'll never fully recover from the trauma. But I'm not going to let the rake control my life. I'm going to keep fighting, keep moving forward, and keep sharing my story. In the weeks that followed, I found comfort in the stories of others who'd survived encounters with the rake. We formed a sort of community, sharing our experiences and supporting each other through the fear and uncertainty. Looking back, I feel lucky to be alive. The rake is a creature that most folks never come across, and from what I've read, those who do don't often live to tell the tale. But in a weird way, I'm grateful for the experience. It's made me more aware of the dangers that could be lurking out there, and it's given me a new appreciation for life. My name is Andrew, and I have an extraordinary tale to share about an encounter I had in the Grand Canyon National Park. I was on a rafting trip with my friends, a tradition we've had for years. This year, the Grand Canyon was our chosen destination, and it was a bright afternoon when the incident occurred. We had left on our journey from a launch point at the top of the river. I remember the air was crisp, and the sound of the rushing water was a constant companion. We navigated the river's twists and turns, each bend revealing more of the park's breathtaking beauty. As we were maneuvering through a particularly challenging rapid, my eyes were scanning the surroundings. I've always been fascinated by wildlife, always on the lookout for something unusual. And I was about to come across something truly remarkable. We reached a calm stretch of the river, and I steered us towards a sandy bank for a break. As I was securing the raft, I glanced up towards the canyon walls, and suddenly, I froze, 
perched on a ledge. About a hundred feet above us was a creature that resembled a bird, but was the size of a human. It was colossal. And as I squinted, I could make out the face of an eagle and glossy black feathers and broad, powerful wings. But its eyes were sharp and intelligent, and it stood on two legs, much like a human. Instinctively, I moved towards it, leaving the others behind. For some reason, I was being drawn closer. However, once I got close enough to see it clearly, fear gripped me. But as I scrutinized the creature, I realized that it didn't seem hostile or dangerous. In fact, it looked just as startled to see us as we were to see it. As I stood there, gazing at the creature in astonishment and disbelief, I couldn't help but marvel at its immense size. It must have been at least six feet tall, its silhouette stark against the canyon wall. Its body was covered in sleek, dark feathers, which contrasted sharply with the red and orange hues of the canyon. Its muscular wings were folded at its sides, spanning an impressive length. My heart pounded with fear. The legends I had heard about Thunderbirds flashed through my mind. But as I observed the creature more closely, I noticed that it had a regal expression in its large, golden eyes. It seemed curious rather than threatening. The creature spread its wings, a slow, deliberate movement that was both awe-inspiring and intimidating. I held my breath, unsure of how it would react. To my surprise, it didn't take flight. Instead, it remained perched on the ledge, tilting its head slightly as if trying to understand our presence. I decided to take a step back, hoping to show that we meant no harm. To my relief, the creature mirrored my movement, retracting its wings slightly. It was as if it understood my intentions and didn't want to provoke us. We continued this silent exchange, each of us observing the other. It was a surreal experience, like being part of a silent dialogue between two beings from different worlds. I felt a sense of connection, a bond formed through our mutual curiosity. Time seemed to stand still as we remained locked in our gaze. The river around us was tranquil, as if holding its breath, creating an atmosphere of enchantment and mystery. It felt like I had stumbled into a different world, a place where mythical creatures were real. Despite the fear still simmering within me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder. I was witnessing something extraordinary, a moment that most people could only dream of. But as much as I wanted to stay and delve deeper into the encounter, a part of me knew it was time to retreat. With a final glance at the creature, I slowly turned around, my heart pounding in my chest. I made my way back to where my friends were still lounging by the raft, my mind racing with a mix of emotions. I couldn't wait to share my encounter with them, to describe in vivid detail what I had just experienced. They could see the truth in my eyes. I recounted every detail, from the creature's appearance to our silent communication. They listened intently, hanging on to every word. Some were amazed while others remained skeptical. Then, as a group, we all continued down the river, but despite all of us looking around, we found no further signs of the creature. The rest of the day passed by in a blur, a mix of thrilling rapids and laughter with my friends. We concluded our rafting trip as planned, reaching our campsite just as the sun began to set. Emotionally, each friend had a different response to my unexpected encounter. Some felt a sense of wonder and gratitude, while others felt a lingering unease, a reminder of the unknown lurking within the depths of the canyon. But we all agreed that it was a day we would never forget. And for me, a day that had affected me deeper than I ever could have imagined.